Hi, I'm David Moditz. I'm a, I'm, I'm a research associate here at the computer lab at the University of Cambridge. My primary interest is um, psychology of fraud, cybercrime and scams. Today we'll be talking about deception and consumer behavior. There are two possible ways to look at deception. We could construe deception as, um, as, in, as if it was in fraud. So falling for a scam would then be an error in judgment, as a break in rational choice theory. Or we could see fraud as an illegitimate marketing offer, which would mean that the marketing rules apply, um, only the end product is illegal. The other way to look at the um, deception would be to construe it as manipulation. That is, um, basically we deceive to get people um, to comply with our requests. And if that is the case, then consumer psychology would apply and social psychology of persuasion would apply. Okay, deception is fraud. Well, falling for a scam is not rational. Many scams are transparent on purpose um, to catch only the very naive. Researchers will tell you that um, that saves an effort for scammers. And falling for a scam is not about intelligence as then better educated or older people would just never fall for scams. And our research shows that this is simply not true. However, there still are some psychological mechanisms that were actually designed to modify our behavior. And these mechanisms elicit compliance, regardless of the motivation behind them. So either for fraud or something else. So let's make a clear distinction here. There are two things, two concepts that work in this particular field. First is motivation. So the motivation for an action is not the same as the persuasive techniques that are used. In our context, the motivation could be to defraud someone or to exploit someone's emotions or to sell a product, to get votes, to get someone to install security updates on their computer to get someone to avoid visit, visiting a phishing site. So the actors are usually different, but the end product is just the same. Regardless of intent, the mechanisms just work. The government agencies, the scammers, the politicians, and the security experts are free to use the same persuasive techniques that have been distilled over hundreds of years. And many of them do in fact use them. Here are just a few examples of persuasive techniques that have been empirically proven to work for good and bad guys alike. Self-control. The inability to control oneself leads to impulsive purchases, to responding to scammers, to engaging in risky behaviors, to ignoring security advice, and many, many other things. Lack of premeditation. So premeditation, or the consideration of future consequences, plays an important role in consumer decision-making. For example, the ability to predict future outcomes influences fraud compliance, makes us more likely to fall for scams if we don't foresee what's going to happen. And it also influences the decision to install security updates. Influence of authority. A communication from either pretend or real authority figures strongly influences the decision to buy those advertised products. See, for instance, spin doctors, who actually do earn more money than real doctors. Or, you know, the communication from authority figures would help us resist visiting websites containing malware if this was in warnings. They would make us vote for a specific politician. And authority figures would make us more likely to fall for scams. Need for consistency. The need to be true to our word influences our decisions, to stay the course of a deal, even if the initial parameters change. And this can be exploited in sales, where a seller might increase the price of a, you know, of a certain product, and we would still buy it if we, were, we felt the need to be consistent to honor the deal. And in fraud, where a scammer might just um, start introducing new fees, and new, they, they would just milk us some more, in order, um, and people would just comply because they decided that you know this is how to honor a deal. And there are many other mechanisms. 
Um, and they have not been mentioned so far, and we don't really have the time to go through all of them. But for instance, the just world fallacy, which specifies that people believe that because they are honest, everybody else is honest too. And then can, that can lead to exploitation. The sunk cost fallacy, where people say, well, I've invested so much into something, so if I stop investing now, then I'll certainly lose everything. So it makes more sense to invest some more. But that just increases the losses in the end. There are costs associated with persuasion. So if the use of the persuasive techniques lead to direct victimization, like in fraud, then there are short-term financial costs and there are also other long-term impacts. Emotional costs, lower trust um, across personal and corporate context, risk aversion in consumption, so people would stop buying stuff, so that means lower profits, lower turnaround, and secondary victimization, where people are afraid that they will be treated, and they are actually treated differently once others know that they've been victimized. And there are costs associated with indirect victimization. So if we use persuasive techniques to manipulate people, then nothing happens until they realize that they have been used. And then a number of possible outcomes are, you know, will appear. So there will be an increased resistance to all requests perceived to be in the same context. So people might be reluctant to fall to be full again in the same in the same context. And they might be skeptical you know, towards all offers, regardless of how good or well intentioned they may be. So they might stop listening to security advice, for example. In conclusion, so the use of deception in marketing and security is common. So do you actually need a particular antivirus? So is the state encryption really protecting your privacy? Does Gmail two-factor authentication protect you when the NSA wants to read your mails? The different actors have different motivations to use persuasion, and they usually find a way to justify their actions when they're committed by them. So the old question about who kills people, guns, or other people, applies here too.